Will Richardson is a global speaker, author, and education change agent named one of the top five entrepreneurs to follow by Forbes. He has given keynote speeches, lead breakout sessions, and provided coaching services in over 30 countries on six continents. A former public school educator of 22 years, Will has spent the last 15 years developing an international reputation as a leading thinker and writer focused on the intersection of social online learning networks, education, and systemic change. Welcome, Will Richardson. Good evening, or good afternoon, or good morning. From wherever you are in the world, thank you so much for spending this time tonight in this conversation that is probably one of the most important conversations we can be having right now. As others have already alluded to, I just want to honor this moment, and this is one of the most complex, challenging moments that we've been in our lifetimes. We have a health crisis. We have um, social unrest. We have environmental and economic challenges that have come together at a time to exhaust us in many ways and to frustrate us and to make us angry and scared. But I also want to suggest to you tonight that it's also an opportunity for us to see things differently and especially with education to maybe come away with a different picture of what an education could be and what it means to our kids and to the future of all of our places wherever we are. This moment is especially challenging for every institution, but it is especially so for schools. And for the last 15 years or so, my work has been to work with leaders and teachers and parents from around the world to help them understand what's happening in the moment so they can make better decisions for their children moving into the future. The contexts that we live in and the context as we understand them are crucially important for us to engage in high-level conversations about change. And in periods of fast change, like the one that we're in right now, the contexts are especially fleeting, and they're shifting with, with such great speed that we have to have these conversations on a regular basis. So tonight, I want to try to frame that conversation a little bit. I want to try to situate us in the realities of this particular moment. Now, that requires that we are willing to ask some really big questions. Questions like, what does it mean to be educated right now in a world where we have so much access and increasing access to people and to knowledge and to technologies from whom we can learn and with whom we can learn? And what is the future that schools are preparing kids for? I know the future is not easy or it is actually unpredictable, but we still can see certain arcs and certain patterns that we, we can bring in to our decision making. And finally, and maybe most difficult, is how do we begin to change the mental models of the way we think about school? You know, we all have experienced school. We are all products of school in many ways. And to suggest that we do things very differently requires us to step aside and step out of those narratives and those stories that we've told for over a century. Now, I want to be really clear. This is not about schools going away. Schools and teachers are important parts of kids' lives. And if they are, if they are thought about and done in ways that really enhance learning, they are the most important places for kids to be when they want to solve problems, when they want to create things, and when they want to, they want to work within the world in, in really powerful ways. But the reality is, is that the school experience really doesn't reflect real life today. And in fact, if we're honest about it, the school experience has rarely reflected real life. I'm reminded of the quote that I'm sure many of you heard by Mark Twain, who said, I'm never going to let my schooling get in the way of my education. So this is an opportunity, and I just want to stress that. I know this pandemic has been brutal in so many ways, but it really is an opportunity for us to think differently and to reimagine and to create an experience of school for kids and teachers that will prepare them for a much more complex, much more fast-changing future than any of us could ever have imagined. Now, one thing that we're going to have to do is we're going to have to go and, and really look at some unpleasant truths in terms of, of the ways that schools operate. The first unpleasant truth that I think we have to acknowledge is this. Most of what we learn, we quickly forget. In fact, if we do a gut check right now and we think about our own schooling experience and think back to how much of what we quote unquote learned in school 
did we actually then employ in our real lives? Or did we call up and use in relevant ways? It's not very much. And that same thing is true for our kids as well. It's not surprising. All the research shows for the last 75 years that there's very little that happens that isn't forgotten fairly quickly when it comes to learning in schools. And so that's unpleasant truth number one. A second unpleasant truth, though, may be even more difficult. And that is that schools were never really built for learning. You know, when you think about it, learning is a natural thing that we do. Look at kids on the playground. Look at young kids who are constantly exploring their world. And they're learning in ways that don't need us to teach them or to, to you know, mediate them or to give them a curriculum. It's just a natural part of our humanity. But the reality is schools are not very natural. <laughs> schools are constructs. Schools don't live in the natural world. And that dissonance is a real problem when we're trying to create environments where kids can learn. The writer Carol Black has a great passage that I think is, articulates this in, in a powerful way. And it's a little bit long, but I want to read it. She says, any wildlife biologist knows that an animal in a zoo will not develop normally if the environment is incompatible with the evolved social needs of its species. But we no longer know this about ourselves. We have radically altered our own evolved species behavior by segregating children artificially in same age peer groups instead of mixed age communities, by compelling them to be indoors and sedentary for most of the day, by asking them to learn from text-based artificial materials instead of contextualized real world activities, by dictating arbitrary timetables for learning rather than following the unfolding of a child's de developmental readiness. Common sense should tell us that all of this will have complex and unpredictable results. And if you want, the, the most powerful quote from that essay is that collecting data on human learning based on children's behavior in school is like collecting data on killer whales based on their behavior at SeaWorld. It's just not the type of environment that basically lends itself to learning. And we all know this, right? I want you to think about a powerful learning moment that you experienced in your life. Think about it, put yourself back into that moment and try to feel it and try to recognize the conditions that surrounded that moment. What was present in that moment? What did you need for that moment to occur in a learning context? I've been asking that question now for the last five or six years to literally hundreds of thousands of teachers and parents in 25 different countries in all parts of the world and I don't think you're gonna be shocked to hear that the responses that I get are amazingly consistent. And they are probably the same responses that are in your heads right now. They require really powerful learning opportunities and experiences require a safe learning environment, it requires fun, it has to be relevant. It's not constrained by time or by age. It's driven by really interesting questions. It's passion and it has a real audience. And I'm betting that what you were thinking about when you thought back to that moment in your life, those are the conditions that existed as well. But now I wanna show you a list of things that people have never, ever, ever said when I've asked them, what are the conditions for deep and powerful learning to occur? No one has ever said, let's put kids in rows. Let's, let's age group them. Let's make sure that whatever they do in school has no real world application. Let's make sure it's all about someone else's questions, that it's all about grades, it's all about carrots and sticks. No one has ever said those things because we all know those are not great conditions for learning to happen. But almost every school that I visited in my 15 years of traveling around the world, almost every one of them has pretty much lived on the right side of that slide with those conditions. Now, here's the deal. Kids basically can do amazing things in terms of the world that they're living in. And one of the reasons that they can do that is because we now live in this world of abundance. You know, schools were built for this idea that things were scarce, that if you wanted to learn algebra or you wanted to learn French or you wanted to learn history, that you had to go to this particular school and be in this particular classroom at this particular time with these particular kids who are your particular age from this particular neighborhood to be with this particular teacher to go through this particular curriculum at this particular pace and be assessed in this particular way. Because if you didn't go through that experience, odds were pretty good. You weren't gonna learn algebra or French or history. 
But that's simply not true any longer. Algebra, French, history, chemistry, any subject that is taught in schools today is in a million different places online. And the reality of it is we now live in this world of abundance, and abundance is really powerful. Abundance means that we have access to pretty much the sum of human knowledge in our pockets, that we have access to billions of potential teachers, people who may not be necessarily the best people in the world, and, and nor do we have the best information in the world, but if we have the literacies, literacies to discern good information from bad, good people from bad, good technologies from bad, that's a very, very powerful place to be right now. And all of those things together, the information and knowledge, the people that we have, the technologies that we have in front of us, provide us with a very amazing set of conditions for learning when we want to pursue learning on our own terms. Now, like I said, kids know this already. Kids absolutely have a sense of what's possible in this moment with the technologies that most of them, or many of them now, are carrying around in their pockets. And I just want to tell you one quick story about a young man in India who was so upset by basically all the attacks that were happening in his community that he decided to create a shoe which if you're wearing this particular shoe and you're being attacked and you kick your attacker, it will electrocute that person. And the shoe was pretty sophisticated. It had a charging mechanism that the battery recharged as you walked on the shoe. And actually, if you did end up kicking someone with it, it automatically sent a signal to local police department that there was an attack taking place. Now, I want to read you uh, excerpt of what this young man wrote about his learning experience. He said, the invention process was an uphill climb as I ran into countless problems. But with the help of many great mentors from LinkedIn and social media, I taught myself programming in various languages. My prototype failed 17 times. And while experimenting, I faced electrocution twice. And my friend actually got a nosebleed in the process. It took me two years to build a working prototype. And in the end, the hard work paid off, and I felt like a superhero. I felt like a superhero. And I want to ask you, how many opportunities do our kids have to feel like a superhero in school? How many opportunities do they have to pursue their passions, to pursue their interests to the level where they are learning deeply and powerfully about all sorts of things that may or may not be in the curriculum, but that teach them how to learn? Now, a final unpleasant truth about schools is that in the last half century, we've begun to move away from schools being a public good, where we prepared students to be functioning and participating members of a democracy or our society, where we prepared kids to do good works in the world. We've moved instead now to schools being a private good, where it really is now a, a way to to get more prestige or to get a higher level of income or whatever else. And most people see schools now as a vehicle to success in a private sense, in a personal sense, not so much in a public sense. And that really has consequences when you think about it. Basically, it means that people want to cheat. You've seen the articles, you've seen, seen the stories about parents who are buying their kids way into into high-ranking schools or into prestigious schools by having people take tests for them or by bribes or whatever else. It's a situation that's not surprising because schools now, again, are more about helping ourselves than about helping those in the community. And as a teacher for 22 years, I can't tell you how many times kids came up to me asking for more points. Hey, Mr. Richardson, I have an 83. I need two points to get a B. What can I do? What's the extra credit? It's a game. Kids just want grades. I saw it in my own children, who as soon as they took the test or as soon as the report card came out, all they wanted to see what was the, what was, what was the number. What was it that was going to get them to that next level? I had very few kids in my, in my tenure as a teacher come up and say, hey, Mr. R, I really found that interesting, and I want to learn more about that. Can you help me do that? because that just wasn't what school was about. It was about finishing it, getting a good grade, moving on to the next thing, and checking all the boxes along the way. And let's not forget, too, that that pathway is a billion-dollar industry 
for a whole bunch of people who are, are running, running mega testing companies, technology companies, and tutoring companies. They want us to buy into that narrative. They need us to buy into that narrative. Because if that narrative breaks, so does their business model. So there is a huge emphasis on maintaining that whole kind of mental model, that narrative and that story that we tell about schools, not because it's good for kids, but it's good for a lot of people who are making lots of money off of that. And the other consequence of it being kind of a private good and having all that competition involved is that it leads to a lot of stress and anxiety and depression and even suicide in some cases. And I'm not suggesting that kids who exhibit all of those, uh, those things are, that all of that is caused by school. Obviously, the world is a really stressful place right now, and we all understand that. But school contributes to it. Uh, a friend of mine, a school psychologist, David Gleason, wrote a great book called At What Cost, where he interviewed over 100 school leaders and asked them, why are so many kids presenting with anxiety and, and stress and these types of issues? And it was really interesting because the school leaders were very honest about the fact that they loaded kids up with too much homework, with too much work to do. They made it all about college. They sleep deprived them, right? And I just want to read this excerpt because I think it's really powerful. He said, instead of schools supporting adolescents' emerging passions, drive for connection and collaboration, courage to do things in new ways and their creative imaginations, despite our best intentions, we shut them down, we make them fear each other's successes, we overwork them with the same old kinds of learning, we do little to support their creative imaginations, we sleep deprive them, set them up for a sense of inadequacy and competition, offer them a set of values and goals that research has shown have little to do with much of anything that is positive in life, like well-being, social and emotional intelligence, happiness, or even financial or professional success. And here's the really kind of sad part of that story. When he said to them, well, why don't you just stop doing that stuff? Why don't you just stop giving them all that homework and making it all about college and sleep depriving them? Their answer by and large was, well, we can't do that because then our reputations would suffer. We wouldn't be seen as rigorous. We wouldn't be seen as the place where kids need to go to be successful. I think that's a powerful indictment in many ways on the emphasis that we put on things in school that we shouldn't be emphasizing. So for all of those reasons and some others that we don't have time for, we're now faced with an educational system that was built for a time that no longer exists, isn't really well suited to the way people learn, for outcomes that are not serving the communal good any longer, and has increasingly negative effects on our children and isn't, them, isn't preparing them for a very uncertain and complex future. So what do the, does this current moment tell us about the future of schools and how we reimagine it? What are some of the road signs that we can look to to try to get a sense of where education is in this moment and how we have to begin to have conversations about how to reimagine it? Well, I think it's pretty obvious that in many ways, education is beginning to come apart at the seams. This is especially going to happen in higher ed, as, especially in this moment with COVID and all of the economic stress and all of the other types of stresses that higher ed and universities are going through right now. We're going to emerge with a higher education picture, I think, that is going to be really different from the one that we entered into uh, earlier this year. But you can see this in lots of different ways on the K through 12 level as well. One thing that's happening, and this started happening, these, these trends were happening before COVID. One thing that's happening is now we're seeing a lot more micro schools. We're seeing a lot of people say, you know what, it's just not working for us, and we're going to just build a school over here. We're going to start and create something really, really different. And those micro schools are growing at a very rapid pace. In fact, I'm amazed at how many different options are springing up all over the place that take a very, very different look, have a very different feel when it comes to how we think about learning in a school context. That's not going to stop. In fact, that's going to simply be amplified by the moment that we're in. There's no question about that. Then you look at companies like Google, who have said, you know what? We don't really need a higher education degree. In fact, in many ways, you hear businesses now saying, we don't really want a higher education degree because kids are not coming out of college with the skills and the dispositions that they need to be successful in our businesses, in our corporations, who are living in the real world. And so Google has created a certificate program now that is very inexpensive, 
and that they have committed to hiring people with that certificate before they hire people with college degrees. And other companies now are following suit because they understand things are changing so quickly and education is simply not keeping up with the needs and the requirements of the workforce right now. And then you look at credentialing. Because if that young man in India is creating and innovating and, and using all sorts of skills and learning, there's no credential for that right now, yet it should be credentialed. He should get credit for that in some way. He sh there should be a way to show that he is an innovative, entrepreneurial, public servant in many ways in the work that he's doing. And so a lot of people are saying, well, why do we have to look at grades? Why do we have to look at GPAs? Why is that the only indicator as to whether or not a student can do something or know something? Um, one of my favorite stories to tell right now is a site called mastery.org, where basically now there's a consortium of hundreds of schools, uh, very prestigious schools from around the world, who are saying, we are no longer going to send kids to college with numbers on transcripts because you know what? Grades are kind of stupid. Grades don't really accurately measure learning. They make it a game. And they have all sorts of negative consequences when we put our efforts on GPAs and, and you know, becoming uh, the valedictorian and salutatorian, which, by the way, over 50% of schools in the United States now have gotten rid of that particular honor, quote unquote. So what are they gonna, what's going to be on the transcript? It's going to be a portfolio, actually, of what kids can do, the skills that they can show that they actually can use in their real lives to problem solve, to create, to, to think critically, to collaborate, all those types of things. And by the way, universities are on board because these schools, they want those kids. They want those kids to come to college. And so that's gonna get figured out. And it is going to be a much, I think, a powerful domino that when that domino falls, it is going to cause a lot of other ripple effects as we, as we go further into the future. And finally, again, you've seen it in the headlines. This is another road sign in California. And by the way, there are over 1,000 universities in this country right now who don't require SAT or ACT scores. They are test optional. And now in California, you can't even submit them if you've taken them because people have seen it as inequitable, that it, it, it really doesn't give a fair chance to kids who can't get tutors, who can't do all the extra practice work that many kids do in order to get those better grades. So all of this is accelerating. All of this is just getting faster and faster because the pandemic has forced us to begin to think out of the box, to begin think, to think differently. We cannot do traditional schooling in a Zoom online environment. And if schools are trying to replicate what they did in face-to-face -face online, that's not sustainable. It's not sustainable for teachers who are absolutely exhausted. It's not sustainable for kids who basically are not learning and are not engaged and who are having all sorts of difficulties keeping up with the curriculum, keeping up with those expectations. Um, this moment requires us to think really differently about what to do. Just really briefly too, the future of work is changing. And for many of you, you know this because you've been home for the last six months. And that is a trend that is going to continue. Many people will go back to the workplace, but a lot of people are never going back. And a lot of companies are saying, we don't want you to come back because actually we're pretty efficient. We're doing some really good work in these remote ways. People are happier being home with their families. There are a lot of affordances to this, but it is gonna be more remote, more isolated, more connected. It's gonna be more self-determined. Work is going to be more of a lifestyle than it is a thing that we do. And so we can see that basically right now because of all the ways that people are looking at the future of work and saying, this is going to be really different. The workforce is going to change very dramatically in the next year, two or three years, five years out. It's going to be a much different place. And the other piece of it is that artificial intelligence is going to make huge inroads in the work that we do. It's going to have a huge impact on the ways that we think about our own work, our own skills, our own labor. This is an example of a, an essay that was recently written by a, an, an artificial intelligence program. It's almost indistinguishable from human text. And it's starting actually to freak some people out because they are seeing that more and more of what we thought we needed humans to do can now be done by technology. Now, some people will say AI is gonna take away jobs. Other people will say AI and technology are gonna create jobs. We're not sure, 
but it's going to be different. There's no question. And by the way, I just want to make this one last example of how algorithms are, and technologies are beginning to impact what we see and what we read and our literacy. So this was a study that was done a couple of years ago where if you went on Google Images and you did a search for professional hair for work, this is what came up. And then if you did a search for unprofessional hair at work, this is what came up. Now, you can see by comparing those two pictures, that is a huge problem. And that is bias that is written into the technologies that are choosing the things that we see that are coming in our feeds, whether you're on Facebook, whether you're on social media, wherever else. This is a huge literacy problem that we are facing right now that schools are not addressing, by the way, that schools really don't know how to address because, again, the technologies are changing so quickly. Now, the really hard part here is that we know that the future the challenges are going to hold, that are going to hold in the future are going to be even more existential. I mean, you can't pick up the newspaper or look on a news website or just follow the news today without seeing how many storms, how many fires, how much change there is in the weather. Um, climate is going to be an issue that our kids are going to have to adapt to, and we're going to have to help them do that. And more and more, the questions that we're going to have to ask are going to be on that existential level, like how do we help them meet the challenges of the future? And I'll say again that one of the ways we do that is not a focus on knowledge, not a focus on how much kids can carry around in their heads or how well they do on tests of knowledge, but really about the skills, literacies, and dispositions that basically are going to be needed in the future. This is the Future of Jobs report for 2018 by the World Economic Forum where they say basically that you know, analytical thinking and innovation, active learning and learning strategies, creativity, originality, and initiative, those are the skills that kids are going to have to have to be successful in the future. And I almost guarantee you that none of your children are getting any grades in any of those things. It's not something that we are assessing. It's not something that we're doing because we can't assess it very easily. And schools right now, because of the ways we rank and sort and whatever else, we like the stuff that's measurable. We struggle with the stuff that's immeasurable, but it's that immeasurable stuff that's going to be more important to our kids' future. So how do we begin this rethink process? How do we begin to really look at what's possible now for education moving forward? Well, I want to use this metaphor by the Indian author Arundhati Roy who in an amazing piece in the Financial Times earlier this year, wrote that the pandemic is a portal. It's a shift. It's a, it's a moment that we're in right now where, where we're moving from one world to a very different world. And I want to read this quote from this article that I think is powerful. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. And this one is no different. It's a portal. It's a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks, and dead ideas, our dead, dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly, with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. And I really do think that that is our big question right now. What will we bring through this portal when it comes to education? And maybe more importantly, what will we leave behind? What are those things that we know in our heart of hearts and from our own experience simply do not work in schools? That is the question that we have to ask right now. So I want to ask you, if you had the opportunity to build a school from scratch, what would you build? What would you create? Where would you start? And I think for almost every one of you, you would start with those conditions for learning that we've all articulated, that it should be a place where kids have passion, where they're asking their own questions, where they are creating things and connecting, where they are safe and where they are inspired on a regular basis by adults who can push them to heights that they can't get to on their own. We wouldn't start with desks in rows or 45-minute time periods. 
or a curriculum that's siloed to the extent where nothing ever overlaps in school. The reality is our future rests on kids being learners, not knowers. And that is where we have to start. Now, the one thing we can't bring through the portal is our fear. With all of those unpleasant truths about schools, with all of the challenges that we currently face, with all of the changes that we see happening every day, the truth is that old solutions are not going to work for these new problems. You know, Einstein has a great quote where he says, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. We're not going to do different if we keep looking backwards and trying to solve our current problems with old thinking, with old models, with old ideas. And this is really, really hard. I get it. As a parent of two kids, I know the idea of doing something different when kids are involved is a scary thing. But we have to trust ourselves. We have to trust our deep concern for children to drive us to a new story of school, to a new narrative that is much more relevant, much healthier, and much more inspiring for the kids who are in our classrooms. So what will we bring and what will we leave? This is a huge moment of opportunity. And conversations like these are places where we need to start. We need to create space for kids to solve the problems that matter to them, to create, to, de to develop solutions to problems that don't even exist yet. And basically, to really think hard about how we help kids flourish in their futures. Thanks very much.